Well, welcome to our discussion of Lot, the father of the wishy-washy. Uh, Lot is a fascinating character. You know, he comes with Avraham from the old country. He comes, he schleps around to, to Egypt and different places. Then they, they part ways. Then he has to save him from the war. Uh, he's, he's stolen uh, by the, uh, during, taken captive during the war. Then Abraham has to save his neck and save his life. Binyon Shuim, the redemption of the captives. Then he gets himself into trouble with, uh, with Sodom and Amora, and then Hashem saves him using the two angels as agents to save him. And then he becomes the father of Moab in a very unseemly story of incest with his daughters. And then the Moabites, people we don't marry, but there's always Ruth that we do marry, the women we, we do marry, the men we don't marry. And uh, this whole story uh, needs some explication. So let's begin at the beginning. Let's get started. So I call him Lot, the father of the wishy-washy. Now, those of you who are not up on wishy-washiness, uh, we need a little, little Charles M. Schultz here, a little peanuts. Uh, he says, next year, I'm going to be a changed person. Ah, his friend says, that's a laugh, Charlie Brown. I mean it. I'm going to be strong and firm. Forget it. You'll always be wishy-washy. Why can't I change just a little bit? So he says, he says to her, he says to her, I'll be wishy-washy. Uh, I'll be uh, wishy one day and washy the next. In other words, he won't be the same as last year. This year, one day he'll be wishy and one day he'll be washy. So, um, but in case you still didn't get it, uh, the definition is uh, feeble, ineffectual, weak, vapid, milk and water, uh, feet, uh, spineless, limp, limp-wristed, namby-pamby, half-hearted, spiritless, irresolute, indecisive. And I really wanna talk about indecisive, informal, wet, wet pathetic, weak need, etc. So these are some mild definitions. Now, so who is Lot? So we need to uh, go back to the family tree. What's the family tree? Family tree, we have Terach, the idol maker, right? Avraham's father made idols. Uh, one of my teachers at Haratzion, Rabbi Midan, pointed out that Avraham was crafted by the rabbis in the model of Gidon, Gideon. If you look in uh, what is it, chapter four, so in uh, chapter six, so in uh, in Judges, you'll see the story of Gideon, and uh, he does smash the idol of his father, and people say to him, "Hey, your son destroyed the idol. Let's get him." So the, the father says, "Yiru Baal, if if Baal is the true God, then let him fight for himself. What do you have to fight for him?" So um, the father kind of winked winked at him and let, let him get away with it, and Gideon becomes the judge of Israel. But in any event, um. So you have Terach, who himself uh, is an idol maker, but he also starts heading to the land of Israel. Why was he going to Israel? There's a tremendous literature today about the notion that Terach was wishy-washy. He was an idol worshiper, but on the other hand, he was thinking of going to Israel and making Aliyah to Israel. Something drew him to the Holy Land of Israel. So he himself may have been a bit wishy-washy. Then he's got these three amazing sons, Nahor, and his wife Milka, Avram, and according to the rabbis, Yiska. Haran, uh, his children are Milka, Yiska, and Lot. So Milka is clearly married to Nahor. There's no question about that. It says it in the text. Nahor marries his, his niece. Why? Because Haran dies. So he married his, his orphaned niece. And Avram takes his orphaned nephew, Lot, with him. Nahor and Milka are the parents of Betuel, and Betuel gave birth to Rivka. And Rivka's very strange brother, we'll talk about later, is Laban, or Lavan. Yaakov, of course, has Yitzchak, of course, is the father of Yaakov. And uh, Lot is the father of, of Ammon and Moab. Now, the idea that Yiska is Sarah, this is a rabbinic idea. Uh, it's nice and neat. That way, everyone's part of the same neat package. Otherwise, we don't really know what Sarah's lineage is. Um, so it's kind of interesting to ponder, um, but that, that's the family tree. So in order to look at Lot, uh, we could have gone back to Terach, maybe we should have, but as I just mentioned, Terach was on the one hand an idol worshiper, an idol maker perhaps. On the other hand, and it says so explicitly, not just in the Midrash, but also um, in, uh, in the book of Joshua, where Terach was the father of Abraham, they worshiped the idols. And uh, Haran, we need to understand the personality of Haran. 
Then we need to understand the personality of Lot, then of Ammon, and then of some other descendants of, of Moab and Ammon. Okay, so let's take a look. Why did Lot, uh, I'm sorry, no, I didn't say Lot. Why did Haran die? A mistake in the uh, document there, sorry about that. Uh, why, did, why did Haran uh, pass away? Um, Haran was Lot's father. Uh, so it, it says, Bayamat Haran, Haran died when his father was still alive. So really, that, that's kind of intriguing. As, as Midrashic students, as rabbinic students, as, as Torah students, we say, really? So why, do, why, did, why did he die? Did he die? Did he die? Why, why, why did he die? What happened? Why did he die? So of course, Rashi says, Midrashic explanation is that he died through his father. He died on the face of his father. What does that mean? His father's lifetime, what does that mean? Through his father. For Terach accused his son Abram before in front of Nimrod, the great, the great uh, emperor, of having smashed idols to pieces, and he cast him into a fiery furnace. Haran, so Avram went into a fiery furnace, and God saved him, like God saved Daniel, like uh, God saved uh, Gidon. Haran waited, he had, Haran didn't want to go into the fiery furnace, and he said to himself, if Avram proves triumphant, I'll be on his side, I'll jump in the fiery furnace. If Nimrod wins, I'll be on his side. When Avram was saved from the fire, he said to Haran, whose side are you on, kid? And Haran says, well, after all, Avram was saved. He's my big brother, my big hero. So I'll be on his side. So uh, I'm on Avram's side. Right? He wasn't sure which side he was on, but now he's on Avram's side. They therefore cast him in the fiery furnace, and he was burned to death because he wasn't a true believer. He just was uh, opportunistic. And it's to this that the name of the place of ur Kazdim alludes, the fire of the Chaldeans, uh, the fire means the fire where Abraham was thrown in and where Haran died. So there was a tremendous trauma in this family. This family uh, was, there was an idol maker. They, they, they tried to force the kids to worship idols and they threw Abraham in the, in the fiery furnace. He's miraculously survives, but Haran is the victim. And Lot, Milka, and Yiska are left as orphans and they need to be adopted. Nahor, the brother of Abraham, is going to marry Milka and Abraham will take Lot under his wing. But you see here the wishy-washy character. The, here's a character who didn't know, was he on the idol side or was he on the monotheistic side? So he didn't really know which side he was on. He was wishy-washy. He was uh, indecisive. And when, when he sees that the, 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 the lot of, the lot, no, no pun, in, pun intended, uh, the lot of Avram was doing well. He decided he was he was against idol worshiping, but he really he was not he was not a great monotheist. He just did it to uh, for opportunistic reasons. So he's wishy washy. Haran is wishy washy. What about Lot? How bad was Lot? Well, let's see. Avram was seventy five when he went out of uh, of, of Ur Kazdim, or maybe Haran. Haran. There's Haran. It's Abraham's brother, there's Haran, which is the city he lived in before he came. His father died there in Haran. Anyway, Avram went as God told him, by Yelach he told Lot. Lot went with him. And notice the structure. Avram went forth as the Lord commanded, and Lot went with him. It's almost like the Midrashic story is explicit in the verse. The Midrashic story is that Haran wasn't sure which side he was on. But when Avram went in the fire, he said, oh, I'll go in the fire too. Same thing with Lot. God told Abraham to go, to go to Israel, and he went because God told him. But Lot, in Yiddish, you say he's a nach schlepper. Since Abraham went, he went with him too. One of the commentators, Rabbi Yosef Bechoshor, a later French commentator, later than Rashi, he says, Lot, his nephew, went with him, seeing that the death of Lot's father, Haran, was indirectly due to Avraham. The death of Lot's father, Haran, was, was indirectly due to Avraham. Why did, why did uh, Haran die? Because of Avraham well, went in the fire. He'd been saved from the Lot's furnace, a deed emulated by Haran, but only after having seen Avraham been saved. Avraham did not feel he could reject him at this stage. He adopted him as if he had been his own son. He said, look, I feel bad. I jumped in the furnace. I survived. The other one didn't. I feel bad. I'll take him under my wing. I'll take him under my wing. Uh, and um, and the Barbara says, Marash, who Matt Smo Avram. 
He didn't go with Avram because God said, like it says with Avram, because the Lord had commanded. He went on his own. He wanted to be with his uncle. As a matter of fact, one commentator points out that he's the opposite of Avram. Avram leaves his family, leaves his heritage, he leaves everything. And Lot doesn't want to separate from his good uncle. Right? When you're orphaned, your uncle's the best thing you got. So he didn't want, did not want to separate from his family. And that's why Lot stays with him. So is he bad? I mean, he's not bad. He went with Avram, but he didn't go for the right reason. Like Lot, like Haran, they didn't have their own convictions. And it's interesting. Um, they went down to Egypt, and when they came back from Egypt, Lot was still there. Lot followed them around. Of course, they were starving, so they went to Egypt to get food. And he went with him, and Lot too. Avram comes from Egypt, and his wife, and everything he has, and Lot. So like an afterthought, and Lot too. Nothing was left. Even Radak, Rabbi David Kimchi says, that nothing was missing. He even took Lot. Even though Egypt is a very comfortable country, it's a beautiful country, it's much more lavish than Canaan, sort of the backwaters, he didn't want to leave Avraham. So there's something kind of endearing about him. You know, he was willing to go with Avraham, even though Egypt was perhaps nicer. So, so far, Lot is a nachschlepper. Avram's going, so he goes along. Avram comes back from Egypt, he comes back too. Then there was a quarrel. Then there was a rift. There was quarreling between the herds of Avram's cattle and those of Lot. Canaanites and the Prevites were in the, dwelling in the land. What does that got to do with it? There was a quarreling between the herds of Abram's cattle and those of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanites and the Prevites were in dwelling in the land. What, is that? what does that have to do with it? So Rashi tries to connect the two halves of the verse. What is the Canaanite presence in Canaan? Got to do with the quarrel. Because of, so he quotes the Midrash Rabbah again. Because Lot's shepherds were wicked men and grazed their cattle in other people's fields, as shepherds sometimes might, Avram shepherds rebuked them for this act of robbery. But they replied, The land has been given to Avram, and since he has no son as heir, Lot will be his heir. Consequently, it's not robbery. And the scripture st states, No, the Torah says they're wrong. The Canaanites and the Prezites abode then. So that Avram is not yet entitled to his possession. Says Rabbi Nisan, a local rabbi here, he says, Avram had to get away from this guy because, uh, welcome Mr. Orban. Avram had to get away from this man. You know why? Because this man had twisted thinking. You know, it's one thing if you have someone who's an out and out robber. So you know you're a righteous man and your nephew is a robber. It's nothing to do with, there will be no influence from the robber to the, the, the righteous man. But if your if your nephew is says he's a righteous man, because really the land belongs to Avraham because it was promised to Avraham, and Lot is the only surviving relative, so he's going to be the heir. So even though Avraham hasn't inherited yet, and Lot has, hasn't inherited, Avraham hasn't died yet, but still, uh, since eventually he's going to get it, therefore uh, he's entitled to it now. This is twisted thinking. This is perverted thinking and something you have to stay far away from. So you might argue also some sort, of, the, the rabbis are seeing Lot as also wishy-washy, meaning is he for robbery or against it? Well, he's for robbery because he robs. He takes his shepherds to other people's fields. But on the other hand, he's got a justification for it. So he's sort of, he's, he's trying to be not that bad. It's kind of wishy-washy. But really the real wishy-washiness hasn't fully set in yet. The one hand, he's a friend of Avram. The other hand, he accompanies him, escorts him. The other hand, he's a bit of a robber. He's not so honest. So now Avram says, look, you go this way, I'll go that way. Some say that Avram said, you go north or south, and he decided to go east. <laughs> you have a trade, you go north or south, he decided to go east towards Sodom. Not actually at Sodom, he was close to Sodom. He lifts his eyes and he sees the whole Jordan Valley, and it's beautiful. It's 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 lush. It before God destroyed it, it was like the Garden of God. It was like Egypt. So it was like Egypt. We just left Egypt. We don't want to go to Egypt. In Egypt, you don't have to depend on God. You don't have to pray for rain. And the rain comes by itself. He wanted this kind of independence from God. Um, it reminds us of lifting your eyes. You know, it could remind us of you know, Eve and Adam. You know, seeing the beautiful fruit. It was beautiful to eat. It's the forbidden fruit, and he's going after the forbidden fruit. He wants to go towards Sodom and Amorah. And we all know as readers, 
we know that Snow Namor is very evil. So here's Lot, who seemed like a pretty nice guy, he came along with Avram, but now we learn that he's a bit of a robber. Something happened to separate Avram from Lot. He is separated from Avraham now, and his eyes are cast on the beauty and somehow not on the spirit of things. And, um, and he is drawn uh, to, to Sodom, to Sadamites. So he's drawn to Abraham, and he's also drawn to Sadamites. He's indecisive. We don't know which side he's on. Now, when the angels come, you could say that the angels came to check it out. Uh, the, the Torah seems to portray God's justice the following way. You can't just declare that, you know, you're going to knock down the Tower of Babel. God has to speak to his entourage and see, you know, what do you think? What should we do? Let's go see what's going on. If you want to destroy Sodom and Amor, of course, you have to talk to Abraham about it. After all, it's his land. Then you have to uh, go to your angels, see, and maybe send the angels physically down to earth. Some say it wasn't the angels, it was just people. He sent holy people, other holy people from those days, sent them to see what's going on. And when they get there, what do they discover? Avram was trying to argue that maybe there's some righteous people. What do you mean? They, these people try to have a guest for the evening. And what happened? They almost raped them, right? Who knows what they were going to do to them? They wanted to know them. These, uh, there was, uh, that's, that's why it's called sodomy. This is it was a violent act that was somehow the idea that he had a guess was somehow anathema to them. This is unbelievable wickedness. So the, the angels determined that indeed Sodom is as wicked as we thought it was, you know, as if God doesn't know. But in, in a concrete way, he sends down the angels and the people to say, is it really that bad? Yep, it's that bad. There was a mob at the door and they wanted to sleep with, with the guest. So uh, so they're that bad. But you have to wonder, what about Lot? Is Lot on trial too? Now it's interesting. Avram never says, don't destroy Sodom. My nephew lives there. Doesn't say that. Avram says, oh, there aren't 10 men? Okay. la di da too bad. What about Lot? Are you just save your nephew? What's going to happen now? So Hashem sends the angels to save Lot. Um, but is Lot being saved because he's a good guy? Or is he not a good guy? So let's see, how does he do? Is he being tested as well? Not just Sodom and Amor, just see how bad they are, but how bad is Lot? Does Lot deserve to be saved or not? Maybe that's the, that's what's going on. Let's see. So the angels come in the evening and Lot is at the gate there. Now he's at the gate. It could mean that he's important. He's an important man in Sodom. And the, the, the people say, oh, you came here and you're judging. Everybody's have an idea that he was actually appointed as a judge. And you don't want to be a judge in an, in an unjust society. Um, some people may find political resonations to that statement. Others may not. But in any event, um, so Lot may have been an important guy in Sodom, which is very damning. And um, he, he, go, he, go, he, he stands up to greet them, and he bows down. So that's very nice. Right? Now, Abraham runs to greet the guests. He doesn't run, but he got up. That's nice. And he bowed down to them, which is nice. And look what he says. He said, oh, master, my masters, soon I'll be out of the hand. Come on, you know, escape to, 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 to your servants, that's, that's me, uh, Lot's house, and uh, rest and wash your legs. And, um, and you'll wake up in the morning and you'll go, go on your way. So they said, no, no, we'll sleep in the street. Now, it could be that they did not want to... Um, have anything to do with this wicked man, this washy-washy kind of a guy. But he said, no, I insist, I insist. So they, they, they escaped over there to his house. Some say that they kind of had to scurry away because people were attacking them. And he, and he made them a drinking banquet. It's very nice. He made matzahs for them. Now, compared to Avraham, Avraham made cakes. Abraham had butter. Abraham had uh, meat. He slaughtered the cow. Um, so it, it doesn't compare, but it's not bad. I mean, as a knockoff, as uh, someone who's sort of a protege of of Abraham, it's you know, a cheap imitation, but but it's it's something. So how's he doing? He's doing pretty well. 
the angels came to see how he's doing it. And sure enough, he, he's, he's, he's somewhat Abrahamic. He's somewhat Abrahamic. Well, let's see if he continues or if he gets more wishy-washy. Now, <clears throat> Lot's morality. Well, we just said that he brought them in, but then everyone came to attack the house, to attack the men. They said, we want, take, we want the men to come out and we will attack them. We will, uh, we will sleep with them. So Vayamar Alna Achai Tare, he says, no, don't, don't, don't do something so bad like that. So what should they do instead? The famous wishy-washy statement. Don't sodomize my guests. Rape my daughters. What? I have two daughters. They don't know any men. And later we say that they have, that they have husbands. So what do you mean they don't know any men? So the Chizkuni says they were not chased. They did not shy away from engaging in seducing men, but they initiate kind of relations with their own father. So it, it's a little misleading. They didn't know any men. Did they, maybe they just didn't engage in certain acts, but they were still very seductive and licentious. But in any event, it's a mysterious kind of thing. How could they have husbands if they never knew a man? But in any event, I have these daughters. They don't know any man. They never knew a man. I'll take them out to you. You do whatever you want with them. But don't harm these people that came under my, my roof. What? The Sforno said, well, he hoped the fiancés of his daughters would come to their aid. That's a very nice, generous reading of it. But uh, most people would say no. Ramban explains this wishy-washy character. From the praise of this man, we see his rep reprehensibility. <laughs> so Ramban, Nachmanides, is a master of Tanakh. He says, wishy-washy 100%. The text is praising him, and we see also how reprehensible he is. But he exerted himself a lot for the sake of his guests, to save them. For they have come into the shelter of his roof, but to appease the men in the city by giving away his daughters for promiscuity was nothing but evil heartedness, for it showed that promiscuity wasn't disgusting in his eyes. And in his opinion, he wasn't doing great injustice to his daughters. You know, what is it? Everyone wants to sleep with them. Group rape. What do they call that? Uh, nah. That's fine. That's not a big deal. Our rabbis say the custom of the world is that one gives himself over to the, protect his daughters and wife and kill or be killed. But this one, Lot, gives over his daughters to make sort with them. There's usually, you, you give your life for your daughters to save them. He gives his daughters to save himself. So God said to him, in the end, you'll see you are keeping them for yourself. In the end, who sleeps with them? Not these men at the door because the angels uh, smote the, 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 the crazy uh, sodomites and they escaped with Lot. Uh, but who does sleep with these women? Lot himself. So there's something very sort of poetic justice about that. He tried to give them to other people. Lends out he unknowingly, when he's stone drunk, lends out sleeping with them himself. So we, we praise this man, he's, he, he's very hospitable, tries to save the guests, and he also offers his daughters, he has no morality, or he has some morality, but not others. He's wishy-washy. And now for the great wishy-washy moment. See one second, a little typo there. Now for the great wishy-washy moment, here we go. This is the great, if you haven't been convinced that he's wishy-washy, you say, no, maybe he's evil, maybe he's not evil. If you're not sure what he is, if you're wishy-washy about whether he's wishy-washy, watch the next slide. What happens? It's hard to leave Sodom. When we read this verse from the Torah, we read it like this. He paused, he, he lingered, he hesitated. He hesitated, hesitated. We, we, we linger on that word because it, it means that he lingered. When he was told by the angels to get out of there, what does he do? He's not sure if he wants to get out. Why? Rashi says he's lingered to save his property. Save my life or my property? My life or my money? Let me think about it, right? Benny, uh, Benny Youngman, what was his name? Uh, Henny Youngman. Uh, let me think about it for a minute. My life or my property? Mama, he's not sure. What should he do? 
Um, Shadal says the word Bait Mama comes from Mama. Notice it has the word Mama. He said to himself, ah, What should I do? What should I do? Should I leave? The angels say I should go. But look, I got all this money over here. What should I do? What should I do? So he says, What, what? And, and the Shadal says as follows. Somebody who lingers in Hebrew means he doesn't know what to do. And he's asking this one and that one, what should I do? What should I do? And his friends give him, give him advice. This one says go. This one says don't go. He's wishy and he's washy. He's not sure. And so he doesn't, because he's not sure, he doesn't do anything. And then he stays there because he doesn't know what to do. He can't get the right advice. And don't we see that had, had he not, um, uh, it, 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 we see later when uh, Judah, sa Judah says to uh, Jacob, if you were not mit mama, if you didn't say, what should we do? What should we do? How should we get food from Egypt? How should we go? What are we going to do? We don't. If he didn't keep doing that, we could have come back twice. So it's a matter of lingering. It's, it, it, it takes time. It's not just that he wasn't, wasn't sure what to do for a split second. He's lingering and over a course of minutes or hours, he's not sure what to do. He is wishy washy. He's not sure if he wants to leave Sodom and save his life. He is so attracted to the wickedness and the, the uh, hedonism of Sodom. So, why did God save Lot? Some of you are thinking, boy, this guy, this guy is really horrible. Uh, why, then, why would God save him? Why would God save him? So what does it say? What does the Torah tell us? As, as Hashem is destroying uh, all these cities of the plains, God remembered Abraham. He remembered Abraham and he saved Lot. Whether it was Abraham's prayer, you remember? Did Abraham pray for his nephew? We don't have a text of it, but maybe he did. Presumably he did. Maybe while it's being destroyed, he's praying for him. And is he, uh, but did Avraham request? Did Avraham know that it was hard to request the salvation of Lot said he was so evil? But in any event, when God remembered Abraham, he saved Lot. So Rashi says, what bearing does God's remembrance of Avraham have to do with Lot? So Rashi actually tells us something good about Lot in this particular context. That it has something to do with Avraham. He rem this is again from the Midrash Rabbah, the Midrash. He remembered that Lot knew that Sarah was Avram's wife and that when he heard that Avram said in Egypt regarding Sarah, she is my sister, he did not betray him because he had sympathy with him. This reason God had mercy upon him. He knew how to keep a secret. Very interesting. He was a confidant of Avram. Interesting. He didn't blow the secret. It's interesting. In the middle of this, uh, Rashi is figuring out some sort of merit for Lot himself, not just for Avram, but for Lot himself. So it's interesting, uh, some sort of merit. Certainly he went with Avram to Egypt to think more about this Rashi and what it means. If you have any ideas, you let me know later. If you have any ideas now. The Ramban says, what do you mean he remembered Avram and he, and he saved Lot? What does that mean? He says, Lot was very nice to the big tzaddik, to, to Avram. And he went with him to go travel in the land wherever he was going. He didn't really care why he was going, but he was, you know, he's helping his, his uncle. Presumably it's, it's helpful to have a nephew, you know, schlep your stuff with you and go with you. Somebody familiar. Um, he was going for company, you know. And, and therefore he had merit to be saved because of Avraham. Because it was because of him that he lived in Sodom. If not for Avraham, uh, if not for Abraham, he'd still be in Haran. He wouldn't be in Sodom. In so why is he in Sodom? Because of Abraham. And it's not conceivable that something bad should happen to Lot because he went with Abraham, who was following a mitzvah of God. It's not conceivable. We, we have to save Lot. And that's why Abraham saved Lot also. It's not conceivable that a man who came with me because I, I was listening to God and he accompanied me to keep me company, that nothing bad can happen to him. It's not conceivable. And therefore, Avraham went to great lengths to save his nephew, which we learned about last week. And this week, Hashem goes to great lengths to save this nephew. 
So here Ramban points out that, there, that going with Avraham was, was a good thing. And there's some merit that comes with that as well. Then we have Lot's daughters. If we continue with the family tree and asking, are they wishy-washy? What about his daughters? Well, on the one hand, they come with him. They, they don't, they're not like the sons-in-law who laugh at him. They do escape, and they, they're not like the wife who looks back. They come with him. They're saved. So somehow they merited to be saved. But then they say as follows. The older one said to the younger one, look, our father's old. There's nobody else to marry, like the way people get married and stuff like that. So let's give our father some wine, and we'll sleep with him, and we'll establish some seed and life through our father, uh, Lot. They're going to have incest, which will cause them to have children. Rashi said, they thought, based on the Midrash, they thought the whole world had been destroyed as in the time of the generation of the flood. There's a lot of similarity between Lot and Noah. They both got drunk after the, the terrible episode and the destruction. And they thought the whole world is destroyed. It's just like Sodom. It's just like the flood. So there's nobody here. If there are no men, we have to keep the world going. Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing. But one of them calls this, the child Moab from father. She publicized the fact that it was that her son was a product of incest. That was not proper. It does not show modesty. So on the one end, they committed a disgusting and despicable act. On the other end, they were trying to save the world. You got to give them credit for that, trying to save the world. And that's why the rabbis say that from this, you know, this, this unholy union, there is the Mashiach, because Mashiach is going to save the world. They were trying to save the world too. So, so the daughters of Lot are world savers. They're, they're, they're redeemers. They're also uh, Saddam-like too. Can't help thinking they come from their upbringing. The people there want to want to sleep with the guests, and the um, and these girls they want to sleep with their father. So there's something very Saddam-like about it. On the other hand, they're trying to save the world. And the older one bore the son Moab, and the other one had <coughs> Ammonites. The daughter was immodest, openly proclaimed the son was born of her father. But the younger one named her child in euphemistic fashion and was rewarded for this in the time of Moses. It said regarding the children of Ammon, do not contend. Don't we never we never start up with 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 Ammon at all. With Moab a little bit, but Ammon we treat a little better because they were more modest about the incest. Okay, so there's some modesty there, a little bit of wishy washiness, some good and some bad, which I'm calling that wishy washy, meaning some good tendencies, some bad tendencies. What about Moab? Are uh, the Moabites good or bad? Well, it says in the Torah in Deuteronomy, you cannot marry a Moabite. They can't even convert in. Uh, when they convert in, they st you still can't marry them. Um, even the 10th generation, they cannot marry them. Yeah, they can convert, but you, you have to marry other Moabite convert converts. They can't marry uh, Jews. Why? Because they didn't give you bread and water. Notice Lot gave some bread <laughs> and, and wine or water, but they didn't. The Moabites, when we the Jews were passing through the desert, they wouldn't come out and give their brothers or their cousins some bread and water. They didn't do it. And they also hired Bilam to curse us. So at some point, Moab joins the enemy. At some point, Moab becomes, uh, if you look at the psalm that some people say uh, uh, during the weekday, instead of Shira Malot, a very harsh psalm against the, the Moabites because the Moabites wanted the temple to be destroyed. They became our enemies. And when they hired Bilam to curse the Jews, they became Balak, became our enemy. So they took on a different status. But um, but what do the rabbis say? They didn't meet you with bread and water, says the Talmud. But it's the way of the men to go forth. Who is supposed to bring the bread and the water? The men are supposed to go out with the water. You want the Moabite women coming to bring the Jews, the soldiers, the Jewish soldiers, they should bring them bread and water. That would be seductive, right? That would be, that, that would be uh, mixed gender. It would be... It would, be, uh, it would be unseemly. So we didn't expect the women to come. The men should have brought the water. They didn't. We don't marry Moabite men. Moabite women, it's fine. And therefore, since David is a descendant of Ruth, and Ruth was a woman, she can convert, and she's part of the Jewish people. The women, so the, 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 the critics of David who said that he wasn't really Jewish or there's something wrong with his lineage, they were silenced because you're allowed to marry a Moabite woman. So here's the wishy-washy. 
You can't marry the Moabite man because they're no good. But you can marry the Moabite woman because somehow they are good. There's something good about them. So there is, uh, I see within Moab, the wishy-washy element. Now, Eglon was the king of Moab. Now, Eglon oppressed the Jews. He was an oppressor, an occupier, uh, a, a, a no good Nick. Uh, and Ehud was a hero. He came to liberate the Jews from this Eglon, this Moabite oppressor who had conquered parts of Israel and taken over. And Ehud comes supposedly to give him a gift from the Jews, you know, the tax from the Jews, a beautiful gift, Mincha. And he says, uh, you know, um, uh, Ehud said, look, I, I have a special secret from God to tell you. So he stands up on the chair. Ehud takes out his left hand because he was a lefty. And he pulls out his sword, which was supposedly on, you know, on the mute. Uh, he pulls it out, and because he's a lefty, he's able to pull it out from the from the mute side, from the bad side. And he takes it and he steer he spears uh, Moab, the Moabite king, and it got stuck in his belly. So uh, the the uh, Ding Dong, the uh, Eglon king of Moab, is dead. Uh, he's been slain by Ehud, and now the Jews are liberated from the wicked Eglon who's conquering the Jews. But when Ehud said, I have a word from God, Eglon, the king of Moab, stood up. And the rabbi said, he rose from his throne and therefore he merited that Rus was descended from him. If you stand up for God, that's something very good. And you will, there'll be, there'll be something in your future. In the future, he, whether it's his actual daughter or, or descendant, his descendant, according to the rabbis, his daughter is Ruth. And she would be the mother of the great great grandmother of David because her grandfather stood up for God. He also oppressed the Jews, took over parts of the land of Israel promised by God to the Jews. But he stood up for God. He's wishy washy. There's something good about him and also something bad about him. We give him a wonderful descendant named Ruth. Now, Ruth had a, had a sister, according to the rabbis. Orpah was his, her sister. We know the story of Ruth that there was Elimelech. He was married to Naomi. They ran out of food. They moved to uh, to to uh, Moab. There was more food over there. And uh, then Elimelech dies. The boys decide to marry Moabite women. One marries Ruth. One marries Orpah. And the the Midrash Rabbah says they're both daughters of Eglon, this king who was speared in his belly, the big fat king. And um, so, so God says, look, you stood up for me because Ehud said he had a secret from God. You stood up for my honor. I am going to give you children to stand on my throne, the throne of God. You stood up from your throne. I'm going to put your descendants on my throne, the throne of God. David will sit on my throne, the throne of God. Now, Ruth and Orpah. So Ruth and Orpah, they, they both seem very nice. But he, they said, look, we're going to come with you. Naomi, you're going back to Israel. We're coming with you. As, so she said, no, no, don't come with me. So they, uh, they hugged each other and they cried. Uh, they said, okay, we'll go home. And so they started to cry and they kissed each other. But then Ruth, uh, the Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, a kiss of goodbye. She said goodbye. And Ruth clung to her. And then her mother-in-law says, look, Ruth, your sister, excuse me, your sister-in-law, she went back to her nation. You see, she was married to a Jew, but now that the Jewish thing, the gig is up, she's going back to be Moabite again. And she's going back to her gods too. Wishy-washy. She was with the Jewish God, but now she's going back to the non-Jewish God. Go with your sister-in-law. Go ahead. And what was, what was the name of this one who left, left Naomi? Orpa. What does Oref mean? The neck. Well, the Zohar says, a mystical book, why is she called Orpa? She turned her neck on her mother-in-law and she went back and she committed acts of immorality. When she went back, you know, she'd been single for a long time. So she went back and she was very uh, licentious. She became uh, a very loose woman. And the people there didn't, didn't like her. So she went to the Philistine land and everybody was sleeping with her. Rabbis have great imagination about all the people who slept with her and all that. And then she becomes the grandmother of Goliath. 
So it's very interesting. David is the descendant of Ruth, and Goliath is the descendant of Orpah, according to this Midrash. So therefore, we have an interesting phenomenon. When David puts his hand in the bag, takes out a stone and slings it, and struck the Philistine in the forehead, what do we have here? We have nothing less than these two products of wishy-washiness, with David representing the best of Lot, the best of Ruth, the best of Moab, the best of Lot's daughters, the best of Haran, slaying Goliath, who represents the worst of Lot, the worst of Haran, the worst of the daughters of, of Lot, the worst of Eglon, uh, and the worst of Orpah. And David slays the other half of him of his own Moabite heritage. And that's the end of the wishy-washy story. That's that's in the in the end, maybe David himself had some of that wishy-washiness, maybe he had some of that licentiousness, which is still left over from Sodom, left over from the Moabites. And we see that with the story about Sheva. On the other hand, he's the father of Solomon. He builds the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, he is the holy writer of the Psalms. He's, he's so amazing. So David himself may have some of this wishy-washy tendencies, but basically he defeated it. Basically, he's a Baal He repented, and he somehow, he helped the stronger side of himself beat the wishy-washy side of himself, the negative side uh, of himself. So that's the basic theory, that you have a wishy-washiness that runs in the family. Let's take a look at it again. You have Terach is wishy-washy. He makes idols, but he's drawn to Israel. Haran, he's not sure. Is he on Abraham's side or not Abraham's side? He's wishy-washy. He dies in the furnace. Lot says, I'll go with Abraham. That sounds like fun. But then he goes against Abraham. He goes to Sodom. Couldn't be farther from Abraham. Then when the angels come, he gives them, he gives them uh, food. He's a good host. But he also is very licentious. And then he has children, Moab. And the king of Moab is, is good. He stands up for God. But he's also an oppressor of the Jews. And Orpah is bad. But she has a good tendency. She tries to go with with, she, like Orpah is just like Lot. She goes with Ruth to a point, with Naomi to a point, and then she leaves. She's just like the wishy-washy family. And then she goes back to her evil. And Rabbi says she went really far back and she is the, the mother of Goliath, whereas Abraham is the progenitor together with Ruth of David who slays Goliath. However, there's another piece here we need to look at. We mentioned that Nahor is married to Milka. Nahor has a son, Betuel. Betuel has Rivka and Lava. Let's look at Lava. And he also has this wishy washy characteristic. So here we go. Here I thank my son Tani for some nice sources about this. I had brought this to my son's attention. He really researched it very thoroughly as follows The Ramam says that you can't marry a woman during a uh, kind of a wedding during Cholomoi, during Pesach, Sukkos, even the intermediate days. Why not? Because after all, Laban said, finish the week with one wife, and then I'll give you the other wife. You can't mix one joy with the other. So in other words, the Rambam, the Talmud, agrees with, with Laban that it's a good idea not to mix one wedding with another. Or Eliezer says, why don't you bring, bring uh, let Rivka come home? So they said, well, you know, she needs to gather herself together for about a year. The rabbis say, that's a rule. You, a woman has a year. If he wants to engage her, she has a year to get her, get her finances together uh, and whatever she needs for the wedding and then to get married. She says, wait, I, I don't have enough. I want to buy a nice beautiful gown. I want to, to wait table so I can buy, uh, buy my beautiful gown. I, have to, I want to have a special hairdo and I got to, I got to find the right dress. So oh, I want to get married tomorrow. No, no, the men don't understand weddings. So give her a year. Where do we get that law from? From Laban and his family. Uh, what do we say at a wedding to bless a, bless a girl? We say the blessings of, of Laban. Our daughter, you should be the mother of the thousands and the myriads. So uh, there are many halachos and laws we learn from Laban. Laban, however, it says, uh, uh, <clears throat> however, it says in Haggadah, to come and learn Laban the Armenian sought to do to our father for Pharaoh issued an eat against the males, but Laban sought to uproot it all. The rabbis claim that Laban wanted to kill 
Jacob and his entire family when Jacob ran away. Or maybe at some other point. Laban is the worst. Laban is also a great wise man. Many, many laws in the Talmud are derived from Laban. He's a wise man and also an evil destroyer of Jews. So it's an interesting addendum that not only uh, in the Haran branch of the family, the wishy-washiness, but if we go over to Nahor's family, Terach, the grandfather, in the Laban branches, also some wishy-washiness as well. But Tuel did some hospitality, but they say he was trying to poison uh, Eliezer, take the money and run. So he wasn't so greedy then. Um, so what is what, so uh, what is the lesson? It, it, so this was a lesson about a weird guy named Lot, maybe his his, uh, his uh, cousin uh, Laban, or is this something else? Maybe it's about us. Lot, don't think that. Oh, what a wishy-washy guy that Lot. That rabbi really gave it to Lot. He was. He was really wishy-washy. Uh, that's really not the point. The Torah tells us about Lot, not because to learn historically there was once a guy who was wishy-washy and what a, what a pathetic fellow he was. No. It's to tell us that are, we all kind of Lot. You know, we want to go to shul, we want to learn Torah, but we also have other ideas, other things we want to do. And uh, if we look in the mirror, we might find a little bit of Lot uh, in us uh, as well. And I'll let uh, Charles M. Schultz have the final Word, word, he says, you're not good for anything, Charlie Brown. You're wishy-washy, you're immature, and you're stupid. So does my having been born bother you? Or he says, Charlie Brown is an easygoing sort of fella. I'll say he is good old Charlie Brown. He seems to get along with everybody. Nobody hates him. Everybody likes him. Ah, uh, and as Charlie Brown is listening to the conversation, they say, ah, what a wishy-washy character. But in any event, Charlie wasn't so bad, but Lot may have indeed been a pretty bad character. And um, it's interesting to ponder how, uh, whether Lot is really every man. Lot is, Avraham is an unusual character. Lot is just like most of us. Haran is just like most of us. We, we wanna be with the winner. We don't wanna be the loser. We, we have professed great values and one day, Laban is a great, as a gift of gab, he has beautiful words. What should be done? Uh, but, uh, but then there's certain lacking morality. We want to join the righteous. We want to pray with the with the best of them. But then sometimes we're like Lot. We perhaps uh, fail to live up to the high values that we supposedly uh, would like to emulate. We're maybe fans of the righteous, but not righteous enough ourselves. So. That's my thought on uh, on uh, Lot the Wishy Washy, and I at this point open up to any comments or questions. I think Lot is, as I was studying when I first started converting, I think Lot uh, was always one of the most confusing characters to me because up until a few years ago i had always seen him portrayed as oh he's abraham's nephew he's he's got a good lineage so of course he's a great guy and then it, suddenly when you see what happens at sodom and gomorrah you're like what happened here and the more i learn about him the more i'm like this he was not okay I, 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 he made so many bad decisions it's like you he couldn't have been okay then nobody would have done that if he had he it wasn't one bad choice it was a whole bunch of them yeah, it really raises the question, how can God save him altogether? But we say, it's really just for the merit of Avram. And then Rabbi Salvation points out, I mean, of course he saved him. Of course Avram saved him, and of course God saved him, because he had to save him. Why? Uh, Ruth. Right. Yeah. Right. So, so it's really about Ruth. But then, you know, the Ramban is admitting that, well, you know, he did a few good things, you know, uh, so... Uh, He's not the most evil person in the world. Uh, one of the commentators points out, uh, modern commentator Shadal, he said, look, the idea that God would destroy the whole city of Sodom, even though Lot was there, even if Lot, let's say, if we interpret that he was a pretty good guy, that's not unusual. That was God. Abraham never thought that because one righteous person was there, the whole city should be saved. It's understood that when there's an earthquake, righteous people die. Uh, it's the only question was if there was a whole community of righteous people, then what about that? 
um, here's the idea of a minion, that if you have a minion, that means like they represent like a whole Congress. There's a whole nation. Uh, one minion represents all the Jews. So if you have 10 men, it's like you have a community of, of great people, then you can't destroy a city. But the individual here, there, sometimes individuals get swept up with, with tragedy. So that, that wasn't an argument. Uh, but it's still interesting that Avram doesn't, doesn't pray for Lot. Uh, maybe he didn't think it was proper. You know, he was, I'm sure it was in his heart he was praying. I wonder whether he could articulate it. it Save my good for nothing brother and you know, nephew who, despite his all his years <laughs> around me, who's so holy, he decided to live among the Sadamites who were so wicked. You know, good luck to I mean, what is he gonna say? And things uh, just got worse from there, yeah. It's interesting, you know, if you think well, we talked a lot about in Matatio Day, we've been talking a lot about that last few weeks, the image of God. Just think about it. This is sort of the opposite. Uh, Abraham emulates God by being hospitable, etc. But God emulates Abraham because Abraham tried to, to save Lot. He, he risked his life to save Lot. And the angels also risked their lives representing God. They, God sort of put himself on a limb, so to speak, to save Lot. Because it's like, Avram, you didn't pray for him, but after all you did for him, I got to save this guy. It's just like you had mercy on this no good nephew. Probably didn't even thank you for it. Probably never even saw him again. Um, I'm going to save him too, even though he's also no good. So um, it's, it's something very, very interesting. And, and yet, right, he can't be the grandfather of, of Ruth if it's not something good about him. There's some, there is something in him that's the seed of the Mashiach. The Mashiach. Um, is, you know, is there something in him that maybe they just didn't put in the commentary because they it wasn't relevant to us, but maybe he was a better person than was described and we just didn't get the whole picture? No, I think that's what we have to... We have to we have to sort of tease that out of that Ramban and out of the text that yeah there is something very good about this guy. As a matter of fact, um, right, he may have certain characteristics that are just what you need. Um, don't forget, it's a radical theology that says you have to go down with the wicked in order to bring them up, right? The Mashiach, is, 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 is the Gemara says, is in Rome. Why is he doing it in Rome? It's a wicked place. It's, it's a big city. In every big city, there's a lot of bad stuff that goes on. You, the Mashiach is with all the sick people and all the crazy people and all the all the uh, wicked people. That's where Mashiach is. That's that's where the action is. So it could be that he went down to Sodom, you know, to sort of save them. But maybe in the end, he almost didn't save himself. You know, it's like they say the uh, what's oh, the definition? Okay. Good Shaliach from Israel. They someone comes from Israel to save all the Jews, bring them back to Israel. What's the good definition of a good Shaliach? If he brings himself back. Oh. <laughs> After his three-year stint in the, in Israel in America, if he comes back himself, then he's done a great job in saving American Jewry. Um, so maybe Lot came to save Sodom. From it was, it was something about the wickedness there that he needed to sort of turn around. Anyway, what else? Is there any uh, anyone have any idea who these angels were? The names of the angels. Yeah, the rabbis identify them that the, the healer is Raphael and. The, and Gabriel is the one who's punishment, and you know, and uh, um, so so they have they have names for these angels, but uh, the Yosef Bukhoshor is willing to entertain and actually prefers to entertain the notion that they are people, because it says the, it calls them people, and Avram sees them as people, so maybe they were people. Very often we find that, especially in the Book of Kings, that God picked a couple of people and they come as the men of God and they tell something to someone. So it's not inconceivable. but there were other holy men like, you know, Malki Tzedek and other people. There are other holy men and God chose them. So it's not completely out of the realm of possibility. But, you know, the rabbis also see them that they actually were angels and they came yeah. down here and, and all that. And so, um, but the, the, the Yosef Choshor prefers the, the uh, human shot, human interpretation that they were human because if they're angels, then it's a little closer to the Christian inter interpretation. Christian interpretation is that they, he has a vision of God. He sees three angels. Oh, of course, the Trinity, of course. So, so he says, no, no, no. Not only you're wrong. They're not even. They're not even angels. They're actually people, because <laughs> it says the two people can't. The two men. It calls them men. So it also calls them angels. So, um, so and he said Abraham. Yeah, sees, Abraham too sees the angels. And he's talking. He's sitting in his tent. He's talking with God, and he sees angels. Were they men? Were they angels? Were, were these Gabriel or Rachel? Who were they? 
we, 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 we can, can angels disguise themselves as men? And can men be angels? Well, well, uh, I, I have to be careful. I have to be careful on that because, right, th 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 there's a certain point at which we sort of distinguish. I don't know. You know, you had that story at the end of, uh, at the end of, of Rashi. It makes it sound like they're angels, they're fallen angels. But yeah, I kind of associate that with other, other theologies. But uh, it's possible. But of course, one of the central messages is that Abraham stopped his conversation with God to speak to men. So there is an importance in seeing these angels as men not as angels, because that's the whole greatness is that Abraham stopped his vision of God to, to speak to the men um, and how good he was to the men, not to angels. That wasn't the point. Sarah doesn't seem to have any place in this. So. This part, well, yeah, it's interesting. According to the, yeah, you would think she'd be very involved here because if the rabbis are correct about the family tree, Lot is her brother. Right. So it, that has a whole other flavor to the whole story. <laughs> you know, you can't prove it whether she was a brother or not, but it's certainly it's a viable theory, of course, the rabbis have. Maybe they have a tradition about it. We accept it. They have a tradition, we accept it. Um, but yeah, she doesn't seem to have a big say in the right? She doesn't seem to bother. Doesn't, but she doesn't say, why don't you get rid of this nephew? You know, she doesn't <laughs> seem to say anything about it. Um, Avram's always endangering his life and his children's lives. And, you know, she's not always so thrilled about it, but maybe she didn't say anything about this. Yeah, it's what very she said when 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 Lot said, "I want to go, I want to go away from you." What did she say to Abraham? Uh, to Abraham? She's already got rid of one person. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right, she probably was happy, right, right, because it was not a good thing for him. It was, it was weighing him down. The rabbis say that he was he had no no visions of God when he was with, with Lot to some degree. Um, the rabbis in that midrash did connect Sarah and Lot a little bit that he he saved Sarah by not identifying her relationship. So, you know, in that sense, he was loyal to Abraham. It's a loyal uh, nephew. It's a wonderful hour. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any last comments? And we'll have to call it an hour. Any last comments? Okay. Well, thank you all for joining us, and uh, in the next week. We have a special lecture, a joint lecture with the uh, Baron Hirsch, uh, Rabbi, uh, the, Rabbi Dr. Shammai Grossman and his wife talking about the ethics of uh, vaccines. Um, this this time, uh, seven o'clock next Thursday night. And I'll have, I'll have my third homage class on Tuesday night next week. And I also have my uh, uh, my uh, sitter class, uh, the prayer class, Unlocking Prayer, talking about the Amida, Shimon uh next Wednesday night. So, Busy week, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thank you, okay, thank you, thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Rabbi. Nice to have you, Mr. Thanks, Rabbi. Okay. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us. Stay well. Be well. Good night.